Welcome back to American Made by Practical Machinists. My name is Justin Webb from Zealous Manufacturing. So on today's episode, we're gonna continue the mini series on the billet air compressor stand. So if you haven't uh, seen the original video, we talked about the overall design, some of the modularity, why we built it this way. Um, and then we'll actually link the video below. Um, but today we're gonna start with the base. So the base, small item, is what everything will be built up upon that. So you'll have the base, you'll have the middle section, and you have the top layer where the compressor stand actually mounts. So we're gonna go over the cam, kind of how the approach we took, and then I'm gonna actually go over some of the limitations with my current equipment that made me kind of have to adapt the way I, I actually machined this. So let's jump into it. And as always, if you guys have any questions, please comment below and we'll be sure to answer them. So let's start with op one. Op one, we've got a total of 11 operations. Um, if you can see here, I had some drilling operations I tried. Um, we'll go over that in a second, why we did not end up with those. So op one, uh, we're coordinate centered of the part. I always set my part 10 thousandths in on the stock. So I can 10 to 15 usually, so I can guarantee that I can clean up that top surface. So we're gonna go in with a 3 8 chip breaker bull nose. This is a 15th out corner radius going in at a little less than 2,000 feet per tooth uh, at about 825 surface feet a minute. So um, with this tool, especially in the smaller machine, if you can see here, I set, I lower my uh, roughing step down uh, just because I don't have a lot of power in this machine. So if I go uh, like half inch, sometimes I can kind of stall out, um, especially I wanted to get a higher feed rate here. So um, we went with three ace. After we do the roughing, we go to the facing operation. So uh, this machine, I've got some issues with the spindle tram. Um, I haven't had time to shim it or whatnot, so I always have to set my facing operation 90 degrees to my X. If I do it the other way, we can change that quickly. All right, so if I do it this direction, I do get a little lip from the, uh, like I said, spindle not being perfectly trammed. Um, but so if I know I'm running it in the small machine, I just set this to 90. There's really no time difference and I get a great finish. So as you can see in the final product. Then we are gonna go in, um, so time out, let me go back. A lot of people like my face finishes on these products. So I'm just running a, it's a 38 millimeter four flute uh, shell mill, face mill, whatever you wanna call it, shoulder 90 degree mill, whatever. Um, I'm running at uh, 2,600 feet a minute, and I'm running at 2,000 feet per tooth. On this tool, I never take more than 20 thousandths per pass. I've noticed when I go any deeper, um, I don't get as nice of a finish. Um, and then I will actually also, you'll see it here once I find it there, um, pass extension, I'm going at about three quarters of an inch, um, and I step over about inch and 20 thousandths. Um, this is, I almost never change this tool um, unless I'm running out of travels. I'll, I'll shorten my, you know, pass extension if I can, um, but I almost never change this tool because it's just tried and true and I know this finish is always good. Um, so for those of you that always ask about the face finish, that's the tool. If you need any more info on the actual tool, hit me up. I'll be sure to get you that info. Going to go in with a 3 8 square just to do the outside contour. Um, I run two passes, a spring pass, just to make sure I have a nice finish. Um, and then if you notice here, I always run a 45 degree lead in, lead out, um, just so I don't have a sudden jut in. Because these machines are not as rigid as, say, you know, your epoxy filled granite style machines, um, that sudden 90 degree in. Uh, on the lead in can kind of leave you a little bit of a mark sometimes. So we'll go to our lead ins here. So this is what I mean by 90 degree lead in, right? Straight in, straight out. Um, so I always run a 45 
degree lead in so it kind of eases into that contour as it's coming in. Here's where I discussed boring versus drilling. So I had to bore all these holes. Um, everybody else would drill these holes. So for some reason I was struggling no matter what I did with my speeds and feeds. Uh, I try to drill here. Drill here, sorry. Uh, we'll regenerate that. So uh, 5 sixteenths drill. I ran a stubby carbide to try and drill out for the tap or the thread mill because we don't actually tap in this machine, but thread mill. And um, no matter what I did, uh, I tried going into my torque curve. I tried less feed. I tried shorter pecking cycles. I even went down to as small as like 80 thousandths, 80 to 90 thousandths pecking cycles. And I could not get this drill to cooperate. But there's really this operation. I tried a couple different drills um, and it kept stalling out. Now this machine, I believe is a one and a half horse power motor. So obviously you don't get that at your top end of your spindle. So I played with the torque curve, tried to do it inside the max power there as well. I just couldn't get it to work. Um, I have a quite a bit of parts to run on this. So I just said, you know what, we're not even going to play with that. We're just going to board out quick. So board it out. And then, uh, with pin gauges, did all my offsets, my wear offsets at the machine with pin gauge to make sure I was at, uh, that five sixteenths diameter I actually went to three thirteen, uh, to make sure everything was good. So we did all the holes with, uh, boring operation, um, which I know is kind of counterintuitive to most, uh, most people have enough power in their machine to drill, but this is how we had to do it. Uh, then we went in thread milled it. So, um, with my thread mill, it's a 240 thousandths diameter thread mill running at 446, 447 ish surface feet a minute. Um, and we're cutting at a thou and a half feet per tooth. I could probably go faster. Um, however, I started this job and I realized I thought I had two thread mills, I only had one. Um, and I was, I made the age old decision of we're just going to limp through with this one. Um, I have since ordered another one, uh, but I wanted to just get through these parts first. I got to run the middles obviously yet, which also require the same thread mill. Um, so I'm going to try and get a little faster on that, but I also run, uh, two passes. I think I've got like a seven or eight thou step over per pass. And then I run a repeat spring pass, um, again, tied to the rigidity of this machine. I just wanted to make sure that these threads were good. Um, they did all check out on a thread gauge. I was very happy, um, but we did a little bit of math. Um, and then I always actually, you'll notice here, I'm starting above the part and below it. Um, I always start at the bottom and work my way up because then I go back through and I chamfer it uh, just so I have a nice start to the thread. Um, but that's just how I run my thread mill operations. I'm curious what you guys would do or what you have done. Um, see if there's some other tips and tricks we could try there. Uh, this is also counterintuitive to most. Um, actually, this is, needs to be regenerated. Um, but uh, I I just took a 3 16 ball and mill to do my countersink. I don't have a countersink big enough for this uh, size. And when I did some calculations and uh, feeds and speeds on it, I was getting a little of the power band where I thought I might have the same issue as the drill. Um, I actually use this same tool uh, for another part that ran before this and a part that will run after these. So I just left it in the machine and said, we're just going to 3D surface it quick. Uh, probably running full out 9,800 RPM, 50 inches a minute uh, equates out to about 481 uh, surface feet a minute with about a 2,000 feet per tooth. Um, 2,000 is kind of where I like to run most of the tools in this machine. Um, it's just what seems to be the happy spot here. I think I'm running a 10,000 yep, 10, step down. Um, I could probably go bigger, but I have that bolt that's going to sit in there and I wanted it to sit nice. Uh, then we go through, I put a bigger chamfer on the outside. Um, so I run the 2D contour uh, with my 45 degree helical chamfer mill. Uh, again, running all out, all 10,000 RPM we have here, uh, 1,000 feet per tooth. I could probably go a little faster. I've had some issues with this tool periodically. 
um, with the rigidity of the machine. If I run too fast, it kind of leaves a little bit of a lip, um, but this ran really good in this instance. So that is op one. So now let's flip it. So when we flip it, op two, you're gonna see work coordinate system. This is one of the problems with parametric modeling. Anytime something changes, you always have to regenerate, um, but nothing's changed, I know that, in this part. Um, so here, we're picking up off that bore and we're picking up off the bottom machine surface. So we ran this in uh, some Yahoo uh, Pat, Shout out, great idea. Uh, though it's definitely a Yahoo move, but I needed to get these parts done quickly. So we had some milled uh, soft jaw parallels, we'll call them, and that's what we did. So picked up off the bottom, I knew that was flat, um, and I knew that machined bore was there, so I could use that for all these parts. Ran the ghost stop to butt up against. So um, just rip off the top hat, uh, again with that same 3 eighths, chip breaker, rougher, uh, some people call it a corn cob rougher, um, but this one I didn't run in the power band, but it still ran fine because I wasn't taking that much off. We're running uh, 930 surface feet a minute at about a thou and a half feet per tooth. Uh, full depth, uh, if you notice here, I still have my 375 thou step down, but it's one pass because there wasn't that much material left over on the top hat or the carrier, as some other people reference it. Uh, face mill, same exact parameters, still running that 90 degree uh, to the x-axis in relation to the x-axis, I should say, um, and that cleans that all up. Ran a quarter inch ball for the big round over. So if you reference the first video, uh, we'll link it below in this mini series, um, I picked a very standard size for these. I did not have a corner under this size, I don't do a lot of corner rounder tools. It's just something I've never done. Um, it's something I need to get comfortable in. Um, so I'm gonna be doing a, probably a video on that in the future, on setting up corner rounders and just kind of exploring that, tips and tricks on that. But, so I just ran a three, sorry, this is a quarter inch. We ran a quarter inch ball end mill, three flutes. Uh, we're running 621, 622-ish surface feet a minute at a little over 2,000 feet per tooth. Um, and we're probably running a very small step down of 10,000 still um, to get a nice finish on that uh, radius. Nothing more than aesthetic in this aspect. So as long as it blends out, perfectly good. I'm happy. And then we go back through and as we talked about kind of in the ultimate series of the Deber, uh, deburr everything in the machine. So go through, break all these chamfers uh, just to make sure that when this part comes out, it is smooth. So that was op one and op two of this item. Um, curious if you guys have any questions or if there's anything you want more info on, specifically the tooling. Uh, most of the tooling is pretty standard. Um, so all in all, I think we had nine tools for this op one and op two. Um, probably if I would have ran a corner rounder we could have eliminated one tool but then the drills if i would have had the power behind the, the machine drills would have probably added two more tools so i kind of had to play that balance you heard me say it in the when selecting a machine video this tool's only got 10 tool uh 10 position tool changer so i had to get creative with how i did that here so ran nine tools got it done um Ran all 100 pieces, pretty happy with them overall. I wish we could have got a little bit more speed out of it. Um, was seeing some issues in op one uh, with this roughing. Uh, so when I tried to go full depth, like I said, I just was having a little bit of concerns here. Um, I will also say my saw vendor on these was not the most consistent. We had about 45 to 80 thousandths variance in length. So I decided to go a little more conservative um, that way, if I had one that was longer, it just kind of roughed through it, didn't really hesitate too much, but that's kind of how we ran that. So that is the cam side and some of the tooling selection here. If you guys have any questions or you want more information, please let me know. So that's kind of the way we approached it here. Uh, obviously, there's different approaches. You can take a different methodology for all of these things. So. 
Um, I kind of went over some of the things that made me have to rethink with my equipment, um, specifically, you know, that drilling operation that I just don't have the torque to make it make sense. Um, so we ended up boring all those holes as we discussed. Um, so I'm curious to see how you would have tackled this project uh, and how you guys would have approached it. There will be two more videos uh, in this mini series. The middle section, which is the angled stand for the display angle, and then the top plate, which the compressor will mount to. So, uh, hope you guys really like this video. I enjoy doing this. Uh, if you have any questions, drop a comment below. I'll be sure to answer them as quickly as I can. Um, and as always, like, subscribe to Practical Machinist, and look at all the other contributors with their channels as well.